Lorry Ghost Loco is proudly sponsored by the Foxfield Railway. And with that out of the way, let's begin. Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM. And if you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment, how about giving this video a like, maybe subscribing to the channel to help us grow and perhaps even check out our Patreon. Today, I'm here at the railway that sponsors me. Yes, we finally got to the Foxfield Railway and I am very, very excited to be here. And we're going to be taking out something that is not how it started out its life. But also today, I've been told that I have a surprise waiting for me. And this isn't a clever trick of editing. At the point of shooting this bit, I genuinely have no idea what it is that I'm going to be surprised with. So that'll be interesting. Welcome to Lorry Goes Loco. Whilst you've been watching Lorry Goes Loco, have you ever thought I really want to do what he gets to do? Well, I've got good news for you because the Foxfield Railway offer a driver experience course where you'll be welcomed up onto the footplate where you can sample one of these amazing engines close up and get a sense of the sheer power and magnificence that they present. It's a treat for all of the senses. Not only do you get to feel the power of the regulator, but you'll feel the heat emanating from the fire beneath you. And believe me, being on the footplate is one of the best experiences that this world has to offer. And it's not just the driving. You'll be shown how to swing a shovel and how to fire a steam locomotive, all under the watchful eye of our experienced volunteers who will tell you everything that you need to know and keep a watchful eye on you. And just think, this could be you driving a full-size steam locomotive. And that's not all. As part of your day, you'll be taken up into our signal box and shown how a railway works safely. Absolutely no experience is needed, so check out the link in the video description to book. And remember, for exclusive news, events, and early access to tickets, follow the link in the video description and sign up to the Foxfield Railways newsletter. And remember, click the little box that says found by LMM to let them know you found it through me. And that will keep our wonderful relationship going well. And that means I can keep bringing you exclusive news, events, and competitions working with the railway. So that sounds pretty good really, doesn't it? The locomotive behind me was built in 1961. However, it did not start its life looking like this at all. In fact, this started life as a very different machine, almost unrecognizable, because the diesel behind me started life as a Sentinel steam locomotive. Yes, this is one of those conversions. It's not a diesel pretending to be a steam locomotive. No, this was re-engined and significantly changed to move with the time. This was done by a firm called Thomas Hill, and they were a dealer for Sentinels. Originally, they'd started with road steam and then evolved to be a dealer for the railway engines as well. And that involved servicing, looking after, and the after-sales care. And as part of the changing times in the 50s, as people were going, you know what, rather than having to turn up a couple of hours before and put a fire in, oil around, walking up and going, doot, and it's running. That was really starting to catch on. Oh, heaven knows why you'd want to do doot rather than spending three hours in the morning. But uh, funnily enough, it was rather catching on for industry. And they realized as the locomotives were coming back to them for more work, especially with the Sentinel's high pressure boiler, which generally was take it out and put a new one in. It's a lot easier and suited the clients to completely rebuild it into something new and different. This is number 111C of 1961, and it's C because it's a conversion. Now, when we say conversion, just how much of a conversion are we talking about? How much of this lived a previous life as a steam engine? It's actually not that much. Obviously, everything from up here is brand spanking new. The remains of the original Sentinel are down here. The axle boxes are those of the steam engine, and as part of that, you can tell they look slightly odd when compared to the rest of the modern sleek design. The springs, the frames themselves are all the original engine, as too are the wheel sets, the pinion and chain that gives you the drive. Everything else, including the buffer beam, is brand spanking new. Now the idea behind all of this was that it was cheaper and easier to use the existing frames, the base of a locomotive, and then 
advance it and make it modern, to modernise, for lack of a better term. Because putting a newfangled modern diesel unit into there and using a hydraulic drive that fed the same pinion drive, the same gear and chain, kind of made sense. And as the locomotives were coming in to Thomas Hill to be worked on, it was cheaper than just constructing a brand new engine and meant that you could get use out of something that was no longer really wanted, as steam was very much, well, on the way out. Now, it was more than just converting random Sentinels. Thomas Hill were also converting old Fowlers, but it's with Sentinel where it's particularly interesting. Because in 56, Sentinel themselves had now been taken over by Rolls-Royce, who had decided that they would finish off the remaining steam engines that had been on order. But we're looking on moving forward and Thomas Hill were involved in designing and helping to come up with the idea of the next generation of diesels. And I believe it was then Thomas Hill who were the sole distributors of said locomotive. So they had a very close working relationship with Sentinels going forward. Which is why this thing has the vague kind of similarities to the standard Sentinel diesel shunter. If you didn't know better and you saw this from the front end, you might be inclined to go, it's a baby Sentinel. This grille and front end design and the front handrail that comes across here, your refuge for the shunter, all just harks back to the Sentinel design because there is that family connection. And it's very much the same design language with some lovely little features. It has the recesses here for the shunter to ride on so they are safe, so that they're not hanging over the edge of the locomotive. They are within the frame so they can't hit anything line side and so they can't fall and jar up underneath. They can just hang here. It was thought to be useful for a shunter, to be safe for a shunter. Having handrails across the front as well, the whole way, it gives it this very distinct that utilitarian look, and I really like that. Now, this one has had some modifications over the years, particularly it now has an LED headlight on the front, which it wouldn't have had because LEDs didn't exist, but the front there, the vanguard across the front, it all just, it looks good. The interesting thing about it though, was that they never claimed this to be an original, as it proudly says across the front there, rebuild. This was always advertised as an engine that had started something else, had been changed into something better, easier to use, and just more in keeping with the times. It never was tried to be branded as something else. But when you look at it, if you didn't know that this was indeed a rebuild, you wouldn't actually initially think that this started off life as something else, because aesthetically, it's rather pleasant. The dimensions of all of it just work so very well. It's cute. Everything just works. The size of the cab to the bonnet, the size of the frames to the size of the driving wheels, it all comes together that you would totally overlook this as it was designed and built like this. Not it was adapted and things were changed to make something, but you'd look at this and go, yeah, that's been really well designed. That looks absolutely superb, just like that. Everything in proportion. And for something that was a conversion that was, to lack of a better word, it's not a bodge, but taking something and making it something new always has a degree of bodgery to it, I would never expect it to look just this good. An interesting feature on the front of this is the little drawbar here, which is designed to have a solid bar coupling going. Presumably, this was used for the engineering works to move around some low-level wagons throughout the complex. But we don't really know. So if you do know what this is for, do let us know and put a comment below. Things of this that shouldn't work, but do, I like the size of the cab. It literally runs half the length of the locomotive but it just fits in there and works perfectly. It's got other nice little features like the Santas are just tucked in here with a cutout. It's designed that it's easy for you to get in and work on. It's been designed to be used. I also really like here we have the lifting eyes on the back showing that it's an industrial piece of plant. When this came about, road transport was now becoming a thing but it came from the idea that this would be portable, that you could pick it up and move it to another site. Or if you were moving around on less than stellar track, this was a suitable place to be able to pick the thing up when it fell off. But I always like it, it's such a nice little industrial touch. It makes it feel a bit more chunky than it actually is. Because although it's compact, it gives you a sense of somewhat power. You look at this and go, that is a absolutely stereotypical, what I imagine, little yard shunter. It's not particularly powerful, it's not particularly fast. But to see this in a yard, if you were making a model railway, a micro layout, and you wanted to have a small shunting setup, this is the perfect thing that you'd have in that little layout. Because it's just absolutely 
what we imagine of a small shunting diesel. Now this one particularly, I love how it looks. I love the colour, I love the fact it's got the lining. It takes something that could otherwise be a tad boring and makes it a little bit more exciting. It just brings your attention and to the shapes of it and emphasises the bits of the bodywork. Like the fact that the cab isn't straight the whole way up, at the top of the lining you think it just curves in. It's all just a little bit interesting. It's more than just a box. There was time and effort and design put into this. This machine was ordered and supplied in 1961 to these guys, the Cleveland Bridge and Engineering Company. The Sentinel that it had been converted from was one of the latter designs. So not the traditional Y1 or Y3 that you think of of the LNER, like it's running on the Middleton Railway at the moment, but the more modern design, designed to look like a diesel locomotive with the boiler and the firebox in the cab, and then the engine itself inside a bonnet. So it wasn't too dissimilar to this now, despite being absolutely entirely different. Once the locomotive was rebuilt and supplied to these guys, it spent its entire working life with them, from 1961 all the way up to 2002, where it was bought for preservation and came here to the Foxfield Railway. And then it kind of languished around. It had a very, very slow restoration and finally moved for the first time under its own power in 2015. And then it was used around the railway for shunting and work strains because the locomotive was never fitted with a continuous brake. It never had vacuum or air brake apparatus to work a fitted train, meaning that it can't do passenger trains. It's very much as it was built. In 2018, it went over to the Chase Water Railway, where it had extensive work done and a brand new engine installed, and was repainted and done up to this absolutely wonderful condition that we see it today, and stayed there at the Chase Water Railway, doing a similar job of being a shunter and works trains, all the way up to 2023. It returned back home to the Foxfield Railway, and doesn't it look absolutely superb? And I love something like this, that has such an easy history. But when I say it in easy history, there's a certain bit of what we don't know. We have absolutely no idea what the Sentinel's number was that was converted into this, when that was built, or where that worked. We're pretty sure that it was one of the modern Sentinels, but the rest of it, no idea. The owner has no idea, and everybody I've asked around here has no idea, and when I looked online, no idea. So if you happen to know what number 111C used to be, or where it used to work before it became like this, let us know in the comments because I'd love to know and so would the owner. So with the history of what we know of it covered, whilst I'm up here, let's open up one of the panels here and have a look at the engine. Looking into here is one of the cleanest engine bays I've ever seen. Now I appreciate this has had a lot of work on it and this is a brand new engine that came from a generator that's been installed, but there are limits. It is basically pristine in here. It's not that typical industrial diesel engine bay where there's little bits of leaked diesel or oil everywhere inside it and it looks kind of grubby. This is all just perfectly clean. It's stunningly good condition. I'm frankly amazed. Other little things I like about this that kind of show that it was a product of the times was the fact the engine's floating. It's on rubber engine blocks. It's not just mounted in the frames for everything to shake about. This was actually done properly and I like that. The engine in here is a Rolls-Royce 6C. And that means that it has 174 brake horsepower across six cylinders and a displacement of some 12.17 litres. It's a big old beast. And then that's connected to a torque converter which goes back down to the original drive. So it's still turning the same chains to the same axles as per the Sentinel. So all we've done is removed the boiler and the steam engine and simplified by putting a diesel engine inside it. It still does the same job. And that's quite simple. Obviously, the only other modification is a steam engine. As part of it, you can reverse it. So the drive came straight out of the steam engine to the gears, to the chains. This has to have a torque converter and then a reverser apparatus attached to the torque converter, because otherwise this would just go forward. And as a locomotive, that's generally useless. Now, in terms of what this will pull, it weighs 25 tonnes. And everybody here at the railway goes, well, it runs out of traction before it runs out of grunt. So I haven't got an actual figure for how much it will move, apart from just it moves anything you ask it to. The bigger problem is if you've got a big train with it that's unfitted because it doesn't have the train brake, we'll be stopping it because it's just that light. It doesn't necessarily have the weight on the wheels to be able to stop a heavy train that's unbraked. So with the basics of the engine looked at, 
let's go back behind me into the cab and have a look at the controls. So welcome to the cab of the little Thomas Hill. And this immediately harks back to the design of a Sentinel. Everything in here just feels very Sentinelish. And if you want to see for yourself, then coming up here in the video is the link to the review I did of the Sentinel at the Doon Valley Railway. Now, starting with all this in front of me, it's all very clever because it's all dual control. So I can control all of this from either side and everything, obviously, if I move this, it then moves on that side as well. Things I particularly like are I have a seat here and this seat swivels so I can look this way or that way. So it's designed that I can operate everything just like this and look like that. I just, a little twist, a little twist. Now, the visibility up here is superb. I have the cutout that follows the bonnet so I can see my front buffer from here, meaning that I can buffer up something with ease and it's just a step there to see my rear one. The cab ends short because I have the rear balcony where I can reenact Titanic, but the visibility is superb. There is so much glass in here that visibility all around is magnificent. This thing is very much meant to be single man operation, that you can see everything you need to do from wherever you are in the cab, and that's superb. It also has such nice features as sliding windows, so I can get a bit more of ventilation through on a hot day, because frankly, with this much glass, it would be like being in a greenhouse. The rear door also can be left open to allow that ventilation to come through there. And having the single rear door is a nice feature as well. Just, I like a sliding door at the back. Open up, get a bit of ventilation, particularly when we're going that way in reverse is superb. Now the cab as well is quite spacious. There's lots of nice surfaces like here and over there where you can put your bags and space down there where toolboxes, bags, equipment, all sorts could be stowed. It's just very nice. You don't feel claustrophobic in here. There's enough room you can move around. In fact, you could quite happily have two, three, or even four operators in here without actually hampering on the ability to do your job. It's meant that you have one guy and a shunter who can come in to get out of the rain, but realistically, you could fit a lot more on it. It's just so nicely designed. And of course, it comes from that time where things were and had to be better designed because people had started to realize that maybe you have to treat staff with a bit more love and respect for them to actually do a good job. And they wouldn't accept being strapped to a plank all day they at least wanted a roof. It has other things like little ventilators up here as well to allow air to come in. And then we have all of this in front of me. I like being tucked into this little control desk. I think it's quite smart. It's fitted with all the rage of equipment like windscreen wipers, which I can either do manually using this or using the control down here, which if I have air, will then operate my air powered windscreen wipers, which are fitted all the way around and all work, which is pretty cool. Straight in front of me, we have the throttle. Pushing it away, create more power and that is the go. We have the brake here which apparently is quite sharp which has off, lap and on and then we have the sanders which are forward and reverse over here. The main difference to say a sentinel or anything is that this clutch disengage is also the reverser. So in the middle position here it's in neutral but if I press this button here which is the master switch and that will engage this little flashy light here to let me know that I've got the master on but we're not running, I can then push it in either direction. So if I go for reverse and push it into there, that will be the gear in. And then if I push it all the way over, that will then engage the clutch. Now, this may not work because they are dog gears down there. So you have to have the engine and everything lining up right. So sometimes you have to just wait for it to get into the right position. And the same for this for going forward, push it into this position, we'll put the gear in and then push it all the way and we'll engage the clutch. And then one of these two lights will illuminate to let us know that the system has engaged and we're ready to go. Looking across here, we have some more useful buttons. We have a green button down here, which is go, and a red button there for stop. That's pretty simple. We have a taco here, which is our rev counter, and then a speedo for forwards and backwards. It's one of the weird ones that if we're going one way, it goes that way, and the other this, which goes up to a hearty top speed of 20 miles an hour. We have the transmission temperature fluid here, the transmission temperature pressure here, how many electricals we have in the batteries, and then we have our air down here. Now, this shows us how much we've got in the reservoir, but also how much we apply by pushing the brakes on. We have the engine oil pressure, and then we have the engine temperature. That's pretty much it. Coming around here, we have the master switch here, we have the cab light here, we have side lights fitted on this one, and then front and rear directional headlights fitted here. And then we have the cab heater fitted on that one as well. And that's basically it. Forgetting, of course, 
the horn, which is this one here. And that pretty much is it. It's a super little cab, and I am frankly very excited to take this out for a run. So the next thing to do is all the prep, which I assume, being a relatively modern diesel, is going to be laughably simple. To start the prep, we don't even need to leave the cab, because just down there we have the diesel fuel gauge. So that's useful. And next is down here on the floor. So there's a panel here that I have to lift off and move out of the way, and that reveals this, the dipstick for the final drive. And that is indeed full of the liquid dinosaur, so they can go back. And here is the ice so that we can pull up and twist out to take the thing out of drive should we need to. Leave that, pop that back on, and it's now time to head outside. Having grabbed an oil can, we can make a start on the prep. So, that's just a matter of pulling these off, squirting some oil into that, and once it's full, replacing that, and moving on to the one the other side. Now these are very much the old Sentinel design. And there are two to do on the other side. There's absolutely no point in showing you because they are identical. There's also nothing to do on the springs or the hangers because they're all fitted with grease nipples and that's not part of my daily exam. So that's great, which means the next job is to nip up there. So coming up here, hidden away under here, we have the top of the radiator. So we can reach in, undo the wing nut, open up and go, yes, indeed there is water. Shut that back up and then move over onto this side and check the engine oil, which is down here. And then reaching right into here, I can pull out the dipstick and confirm there is in fact liquid dinosaur on that and then put that back in there. Now, the nice thing about this is that the compressor on the other side is actually oiled by engine oil, so there's no separate dipstick or any system to check, it's just off the engine. And with the prep complete, we can return to the cab, switch on the master switch, and press the green button to go. Let's go get a train! The flagship rolling stock at the Foxfield Railway are the fabulous knotty coaches, and although they are much older than today's locomotive, Pairing them together made a wonderful little light railway train. And soon after we'd been covered up, we headed up, up the line, ready to start filming. But before we could actually start the cameras rolling properly and begin the driving part, Ben had something he wanted to show me. I don't know what's going on. Okay, you may look. Where? At me. On behalf of everyone at Foxwood Railway, May we say thank you to LMM. Oh, you didn't! Oh, that's amazing! <laughs> that's the best thing ever! <laughs> oh, you legend! How did you get it? I've wanted something like this for a long time. <laughs> Where'd you get this made? I had it specially made. People don't really do logos. No! I found oh, no. someone. Feeling very honored and absolutely overjoyed, my first move was to put my new headboard on the front of the locomotive, ready for filming. Last of that, gently take the brake off by doing that and we're going to go very gently with this because as soon as the brake is off enough we'll start creeping so I'm trying desperately not to give everybody on board my very authentic load whiplash these coaches are almost a hundred years older than this however they look absolutely superb with it. This thing would never have pulled anything like those. In fact, this thing probably, as far as I'm aware, hasn't done a trip up the line with passenger stock because it's not fitted to take them. So these are currently unfitted. So this is a very, very rare working and actually genuinely rather exciting. Because I wasn't expecting it when we talked about the trains that we'd take this morning. I wasn't expecting it to look quite this good, but it looks so quintessentially branch line. 
In fact, it's possibly one of my favorite pairings that I've done across the channel so far. It just looks so right. And I'm very, very excited by that. out of here, join the main line as out of the loop. The first thing is just how good the visibility is on this. We're so much higher than the bonnet that my visibility at the front is superb. I can see down to the buffers, I can see forward. It's just absolutely marvelous. And now, as we clear the points, I can open up the throttle. First, you hear the revs pick up. Then you feel the drive start kicking. There's a very evident delay between throttle making noise and the locomotive picking up. You hear all of that going on and then we get the drive. The throttle response itself is quite slow as well. It's all do a little bit, wait for it to think, wait for it to do something and then we'll start moving, it will start happening. So you do have to just be gentle with it and think about it and be careful. But the noise is quite wonderful. It doesn't give a huge sense of roaring power like it's going to pull a house down. It's just quite pleasant, like a little diesel shunter. Something that's just meant to trundle around a yard. In fact, maybe even this railway here going for a full line run is more than you'd expect for it. Now, as we come along here, we need to slow down for a temperature speed restriction. So I'll drop the throttle and get hold of the brake. Now, this is very, very sharp, so you have to be so gentle to put a brake application in, otherwise it will just stop. And whilst that is quite good, the fact that it will just stop, we don't want to be that harsh with it. It is three positions. It's off, lap, and apply. So you can apply a bit and then hold it in the lap position, which will keep that amount of application on. Now, as we come through here and we leave the end of the TSR, we can open it up again. So first the revs, then the speed creeps up. And I'm only about maybe 75% of the way open with this. When you start getting up to almost full throttle, it sounds almost scary. The noise it makes is quite aggressive. But trundling along like this, it's actually very, very pleasant indeed. Now, the ride in here, it is a very short wheelbase, and we do find every single bit of the track, every, every single rail joint, we feel up and early. Now, it's the kind of thing that is almost like being at sea on it. You do feel it going up and down. It's not to say it's not bad, it doesn't ride it badly, you're just very aware that there was a rail joint there, and there's another one there. It's certainly it's not the smoothest thing I've ever been on. The suspension, the way it actually takes each bump, is not too bad. But certainly, yeah, you're very, very aware of it. And of course, short wheelbase, short, <laughs> short locomotive. However, stood here, I feel very nicely positioned. So I'm dropping the throttle off now as we come downhill, and we've got a whistle board coming up. <laughs> Love the air horn and now a speed restriction here. So once again, get a hold of that brake. And it is so beautifully controllable. Just a millimetres worth of application needed there. Again, from what we're doing today, taking this out on a run with the coaches isn't really what this was designed for. It is a small shunting locomotive designed to shunt them out. And for that, it's so beautifully controllable. I've done a bit of buffering up and shunting with the coaches to get them ready earlier and it's just a delight to buffer up with. It's a perfect little shunting machine. And it's obviously, it was what it was designed to do, was to shunt. And with that in mind, it achieves that objective remarkably well. I can't think of many other things I'd actually prefer to have out for a day's shunting, especially 
in a small yard. Because this thing is about perfect for if you wanted to have a locomotive yourself. It's small enough that you could look after it and operate it. You don't need a huge team with you. It's big enough to be useful. Certainly it's a lot more powerful and got a lot more grunt and used to it than say my own Ruston 48, which is in most cases totally useless. Whereas this is a good little engine that frequently finds itself out on the line doing works trains and general shunting around the yard. It's just the right size to be useful. but just more than adequate for what we need to do. Genuinely impressed. But for a small shunting engine, it's absolutely perfect. It's also got some nice little features on it. The fact that if I let go of the throttle, it will shut itself down and will slow itself to a halt. And that is a really, really nice feature. Now coming up in front of me, we've got the first of the level crossing. So we're going to drop our speed right down and come to a stop by the board. Lovely chance to really test the brakes out. So creeping along on the lap position with nothing and then we'll just gently tickle it and the whole thing just rumbles straight to a stop. And that's not even a harsh brake application. Blast of the horn, knock the brake off and we just start creeping away nice and gently like that towards the crossing. Now, it's clear my side and clear on that. Again, the visibility on this is just magnificent. It's got to be one of the best things I've driven where you can just see everywhere. In the parts of the cab, there's maybe three inches of metal in the side there blocking my view. The rest of it is totally open for me to be able to see where we are. And that is just brilliant. It's a joy. It's one of these things that was built from the time where you could just hop in and drive it. It wasn't a taxing day out, it was just a, a thing you could drive. It's a piece of plant designed to be used day in, day out by normal people, not some kind of superman. Now, as we come round here, we're going to have to come to a stop at the next signal. And then something interesting has got to happen. without any problem. Now one of the interesting things about this is the torque converter on it uses the diesel from the fuel tank so it goes from the tank through the torque converter and into the engine which is clever really because you're reusing just one fluid. And I like that a lot. Now we're coming up here to a signal that is against us. This is for the crossing on the main road. So as we come here somebody is going to have to get off and go and operate crossing. On normal operating days, there'll be somebody there manning it. But as this isn't a normal operating day, we have to go and do it manually. And so hopefully there's going to be someone here who goes and sorts that out for me. It is a long, long walk down here. But finally, I'm at the crossing. So, let myself out. Make sure there's no cars. Shot that counterintuitively. Come across. Open up this one and swing it all the way across to here. Drop that in to there. And then open this one like so. And drop this in here. Take out the interlocking and we pull this. And that has now pulled off the signal, ready for the train to come down. So I guess we'll go and watch it come through. So we've got the signal, so the brakes off, and away we go down towards the crossing. 
Yeah, you can keep it nice under control because this is a fairly steep bit of line. So it's quite a challenge now just coming down here with the brake of the locomotive with two unbrake carriages behind us. It's all about being nice and gentle and making sure that we're not picking up too much speed. Proceeding with caution is important rather than trying to react when things are going south. So we're going to creep along here and we can see that the crossing is indeed set. And there's a gentleman down there who looks familiar, but I just one white place where I've seen him before. That driver looks awfully familiar. Now, the noise in here isn't actually too bad. It's a sound that you can quite happily have a conversation. Obviously, when the engine's working harder, well, then you need to make a bit more of a shout. But it's a perfectly pleasant background noise. It's no way intrusive. It's just not bad. Everything about it is just not bad. The seats are relatively comfortable. The way it drives is super. It's just a good little locomotive that, sure, it could be bigger, sure, it could hold back, sure, it could be more powerful, but it's just not bad across the board. It's built for a use, it's built to shunt, and it exceeds in being a little shunter. And frankly, seeing it trundling along the line here, I think it looks absolutely fantastic. And again, to stress the fact that this doesn't normally go out for a line run with coaches, I feel very honoured indeed. And what a silly train it looked like has now turned out to be an absolutely marvellous light railway train. And it just, I can't believe how right it feels. It just feels perfect. So the big question, of course, is would I hug this? 100% yes. It's just like my 48, only a bit more powerful. It's got the same cuteness and charm to it. It's just got a little bit more use. You can certainly look after it on your own. It's a absolutely great little workhorse. And I think it's wonderful. I like being up high overlooking the bonnet and be able to see everything, but not having it obscure my view. I like that engine, I like the purr, I like the delay of it, it all just comes together and works really, really well. And for the guys here at the Foxfield, it's a real asset to the fleet that they've got, doing exactly what it's meant to do. And in this day and age, well, another whistleboard. <laughs> Having a locomotive that isn't back or air fitted, that's able to actually earn its keep and be useful is a real rarity. So this thing still being able to shunt about, earn its keep, is nothing short of brilliant. And yes, it's kind of silly doing a line run on it, but I absolutely love every single moment. Because the Fox Hill line is beautiful. It's lovely overlooking the fields and taking in the scenery from this panorama of the cab. It's absolutely magnificent. And our final bit, as we come round here, over the point, the railway then rises back up so we have to be ready on the throttle and get one last blast of noise as we come into the platform. And that is absolutely brilliant. Something like this that started life as a completely different engine. I was expecting it to feel like more of a bodge. And I know that there was a class of these built just like this as not being conversions. But this thing feels properly together. It doesn't feel like it's converted from something else. It just feels like this was what it was intended to be from the very start. And frankly, I love it. So that brings us to the end of the day here at the Foxfield Railway, taking out this conversion, which is frankly one of the best things I think I've driven in a while. It's absolutely superb and I have loved it. 
It's a real credit to everybody here at the Foxfield Railway because it's a genuinely useful, dare I say it, engine. It's great. So to everybody here at the Foxfield Railway, thank you so much for having me along. If you want more information on the railway, there's a link in the video description to their website. They're always looking for more volunteers and also a link on the website so you can see how to join up and become part of the railway and maybe kind of do the thing that I've been doing and get on the footplate of one of these locomotives. And remember, do check out and subscribe to their YouTube channel. And with that, I'm going to take this for a bit more of a run. Thanks for watching, guys. If you have enjoyed this one, coming off on the screen now are a couple other local reviews that you might enjoy. Cheerah!